It's your floor. Hoping the Holy Ghost gets on us to where we'll have to let off some steam. Now the Holy Ghost. There's no way I could express my heart and my heartfelt joy of being on this campus and to meet so many people and then to be with you. And of course to renew time with Dr. Patterson and Miss Dorothy. And for Dr. Aiken, I'm sorry I preached about him the other night in Joshua 7, but I hope he, I hope he got the message. I, no, no, I'm kidding. I shouldn't have done that because he's really depressed, Dr. Patterson. I mean, we may have to have a healing service. If you got any camphorated oil or any kind, we'll anoint him, motor oil, anything. We'll, we'll use anything on him today if we can just get him out of the pits of despair. But Dr. Aiken, you've been a blessing. And all the professors, you who have expressed so much encouragement and words of kindness to me, may God bless your life. And you have blessed me. And many of you I may not see again because you may not be back to the service tonight. I just want to tell you that I love you. I love this campus. I love what God's doing here. Amen. And I'm praying that out of this group of preachers and, and, and people of God will come those men and women who will shake this nation Amen. back to holiness and godliness and a hunger to walk with God and just love Jesus. Amen. Folks, that's all. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Just stay in love with Jesus. Amen. And I'm praising God, Dr. Patterson, for you giving me this honor and this privilege. We've had a lot of fun. We've joked a lot. But this morning, as I was preparing for, for, this, for, for what God wanted me to say, I could not help but be grateful to God for letting me have this opportunity. I'm a blessed man, and I am so grateful. And I can, I can only say, I'm glad God let me pass this way on my journey to glory. Amen. I will never be the same again. And to be loved and accepted by so many great men of God, and especially these professors and Dr. Patterson, to be accepted and loved by them is a special time in my life, and I praise God. And I just wanted to, out of sincerity, we had a lot of fun, but there comes a time when I just wanted you to know that everything we say and do to each other is out of pure love and joy, and it's to let you know that God didn't save you to ruin you. He saved you to release you so you could enjoy and help those sour Christians learn that you could be saved and have fun. Amen. Amen. There's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. And I'm going to weep and I'm going to laugh. And if they don't like it, they can just keep on weeping. Amen. <laughs> Luke chapter 14. And I'm going to preach from one verse and not really... Am I going to bring a message from this text this morning? I'm going to share what I feel God wants me to share concerning the life of surrender. The life of surrender. I believe it was a man in Romania that said, you in America like to talk about commitment. But commitment is not really the answer. The answer is surrender. Amen. I have no rights, and I must come to the point unconditionally to say, Jesus, here I am. Whatever you want at your disposal, work in me and through me the life and ministry that you want me to be to your glory. And I tell you, folks, that's the way it's going to have to be in the days ahead. Not just commitment, but surrender. In Luke 14, I'm only going to read one verse, verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother, and wife, and children, 
and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't know about you, but in my days of early ministry, as I would come across verses like that, I would sort of pass over them and try to ignore them and not try to find out what God was really saying to my heart. And of course, he's talking about the life of, com of surrender. I'm going to quit using that word commitment after I heard what he said. Whenever I came, when I come to text like this and I read that God says, if I'm going to walk with him, there's some things I've got to hate. And when I saw that word, I began to look at it and say, what in the world is God saying when he tells me that I've got to hate? And I began to look into the word and found out that it doesn't mean that I do not love my parents, I do not love my wife, I do not love my children, I do not love my own life. It doesn't mean that I don't love those around me. But what it does mean is this. I must never allow any relationship or acquaintance that I have in my life to become a priority above my surrender to the Lord Jesus. Amen. Christ must be first and foremost in my priority. I have never seen the lack of people today building seminars in different areas trying to teach us the life of total surrender. People are running across the country, sitting under their guru or their seminar, trying to get a grasp on something of how they can walk with God. But I'm going to give you a little clue, and I want you to hear me now. The first thing that must happen in your life, if you're going to walk with God and be the man and woman of God that you ought to be, you must stay rightly related to Jesus. Amen. Folks, that's first and foremost. And you know what I found out? When I'm rightly related to Him, all of the relationships are right. 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 See, I wouldn't preach near as long if you'd hear me the first time. <laughs> it's repetition that makes me a long-winded preacher. <laughs> preacher one night, I kept drinking water and the lady said the first windmill she'd ever seen run on water. <laughs> I catch it every time I turn around, that's the truth. But I must need it because God puts them in my path. And I enjoy every one of them. What is this thing of surrender? Yesterday morning when I closed out the service, I prayed about even giving an invitation then, but I felt like there needed to be a time when we need to get away and let that sink in and then come back this morning and see if we can do business with God. And folks, to me, to be rightly related to Jesus means I'll be rightly related to my wife. If I'm rightly related to Jesus, I'll be rightly related to the seminary. I'll be rightly related to my parents. God is never going to hurt a man when he comes to him in total surrender. Somehow we've made people feel like if you surrender to Jesus, it's going to take something to hurt you. God has never hurt me in my walk with God. In fact, in my life with Him, if I hadn't have become surrendered, it would have been other things that would have destroyed me and really hurt me. It's in surrender to Him that He saved me from having to be killed by my self-life, by my selfishness, by my pride by my ego, by my, by my self-adulation and self-praise. He saved me from having to be slain by jealousy and gossip and greed and unforgiving spirit because, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot walk with God without constantly dealing with a self-life. And you are living with a monster, and it's not your wife, and it's not your professor. It's you. It's you. And nobody can keep me from the fullness of God but my own choice. No deacon, no Sunday school teacher, no seminary, nobody, nobody can keep me from the fullness of God but my own choice of allowing them to become my problem and refusing to keep Christ in view. In my text, here's what it says. There's things I've got to hate. 
if I'm going to love Jesus supremely. I was in uh, Zimbabwe doing our first conference. That might have been the second conference on revival in Zimbabwe. We just finished a conference in South Africa where the power of God had fallen and men and women were getting right with God, pastors and their wives in real brokenness. Then we went on to Zimbabwe and we saw another moving of God and then we took time to drive up to uh, up to Victoria Falls. I never shall forget when we drove that day, we were driving in a van with no air condition and we had nine people in the van and the trip was a long trip. I mean, it was quite a journey. I wasn't quite as spiritual in that ride as I was in the conference. <laughs> we finally got to Victoria Falls and driving toward it, you can see the, fa the, the, the mist rising up because the falls are so forceful and the height of the water as it drops down in the falls. And watch that mist rise. You can see it before you ever get close to the falls. We couldn't wait hardly till the next morning. Spent the night that night in the hotel and the air conditioners were all out. And there's nothing like sleeping with both doors open. I had a door on this side of the room and a door on this side. And monkeys swinging in the trees outside. <laughs> Not squirrels, but monkeys. And you trying to sleep. And you get up about 2 in the morning and get in a cold tub of water. Just hoping you can cool down a bit. But still the excitement of getting to the falls. The next morning we got up early. And we walked down to the falls. I couldn't believe the sound, the roar, the force, the power of the falls. We started toward it and saw the beautiful water coming over the, the rocks. But then as I got almost to the falls, I looked and here's a statue. A statue of a great missionary called David Livingston. It's high. It's big. It's tall. He's standing sort of like this. In one hand is a scroll, in the other is the Word of God. And he's got this hat on with that uh, protective uh, clothing down the back of his neck from the hot sun of Africa. His face looks leathery from his years in Africa for the glory of God. I stood there and read at that little, the big, or the big square at the bottom that had the write-up about Livingston. And I read what it had to say about him. And here's a man that's been gone for years, but made such an impact on Africa that it is unreal. It's unreal, the heritage he's left that we can still talk about today of his dedication to God. I read it. And Dr. Patterson so helped me. All the beauty of the falls lost its attraction. When I stood there looking at such a man of God, dedicated, surrendered, willing to pour himself out as broken bread and poured out wine to be an influence and power of the life of Christ to touch a nation for God. One man. One man. And yet many of you sit here today and you sit around in the mully grubs and wonder what in the world will I ever do for God. That's not the question. How much of you can become so loyal and committed and surrender to Christ that He can have total control of your life? It's not a question of your ability. It's a question of your availability. It's not responsibility. It's response to His ability. God can use anybody He wishes. In fact, any old bush will do. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Boy, when I called to preach, I had to bat battle through all the traditional preconceived ideas of what people thought a preacher ought to be. I never, I never got over it. You know what? I walked from a meeting one night where they looked at me and said, we just don't believe that you'll make it in the ministry and we just don't think that we ought to take time to lassen you now. So we're just going to sort of watch you for a while. And I want you to know I walked away from that service as a 19-year-old lad got home with my wife and I said, I don't believe I can handle it. 
I don't believe I can stand it. But my wife is such a prophet. I said, I think I'll quit. My wife looked at me and said, you hadn't hardly started. <laughs> That's what I've lived with all of my life, 43 years. And I've loved every minute of it. You know why? God gave me exactly what I needed to keep me out of the mully grubs and self-pity and to walk with God. About the time you think you're ready to change wives, I've got news for you. The other one will be worse. <laughs> and I'm praying she will be. Amen. <laughs> Hang on, buddy. Hang on. Stay in there. God, what is it Manly Bees used to call them? Heavenly sandpaper. <laughs> wives are heavenly sandpaper. You don't need another one. Just accept the fact God gave you what you needed and he, he, she's going to keep rubbing you the wrong way till you shape up. <laughs> Bill, you know what Billy Sunday used to say? He said, you know what? People used to say that uh, uh, Billy Sunday, you're rubbing me the wrong way. He said, well, turn around. <laughs> You can't develop sitting around in your own little world and saying, I need somebody like me. God knows you don't. You need an opposite. Somebody to develop you, make you live up to what God wants you to be and make you do what you can't do by the power of God. That is what God's trying to do to make men, of, men and women of God. Well, I stood there looking at that statue. And here I am, in the 50s, heading down the last years of my ministry. And I want you to know, I walked on, looked over the falls. I enjoyed the falls. They were beautiful. An eighth wonder of the world. But to me, the first wonder that I saw was one man surrendered to God under his control that had such a heart for Africa and, and so surrendered to that nation that he literally touched several countries for God. Now, if God can do it through Livingston, he's a man of like passion as we are. Could he not do it through one of you? Amen. Do you reckon God's got somebody here this morning that is preparing and doing what you're supposed to do that somewhere down the line he's going to so work on you and one day out of southeastern seminary will come somebody who will touch this nation in holy ghost revival and i pray my god let me be instrumental let me be instrumental in these chapel services that whoever that person is or that that man that god wants to preach the word may this be the moment that I can be instrumental in helping that man to come to total surrender to Jesus Christ. Amen. Three things. I, by the way, I came back home. and so, uh, This is not really my type of preaching, but this is what God wants me to do. And I'm going to do it. And so I, I sometimes get ahead of myself. And have, but, you know, uh, God can still use it to the glory of God. Amen. He knew what I was when he got me. I was sitting on a motor coach, my wife and I, in a meeting somewhere, and I picked up a track put out by Dr. James Kennedy, a man that I admire and love tremendously. And it's, it was called The Secret of Commitment. And I started reading it, and it was the story of David Livingston. And suddenly I remembered standing before that statue, God overwhelming me with a man of God saying to me, if I can use Livingston, what can I do with you the rest of your life if you'll quit trying to retar and refire? Amen. Don't try to hang it up. Find out what else God wants to do with you and finish your course. Amen. I want to die with my preaching boots on. Amen. When they go to embalm me, I want them to have to tie my jawbone down for more to holler at Jesus one more time. That doesn't come through just going through seminary and then finding you a place of service and settling down to the comfort zone. That comes from abandonment, surrender, yieldingness, loyalty, priority, 
Lord, I'll never let anything come between me and my surrender to the Lordship of Christ. As I read that track, I broke down and cried for two solid hours because God was saying something to me. I'm in my, I'm about 56 years old at that time. I handed it to my wife and I said, Sue, would you read this? And I said, will you pray for me that this will be the beginning of a fresh ministry in my life that my old days will be my greatest. I want to die and finish my course to where I can let senior citizens know you don't have to fizzle out in your last days. Amen. Amen. Well, I got on my knees and I said, Jesus, I don't know what you're saying, but I'm going to ask you, what are you saying to me? Here I am in a fresh surrender to the will of God. What I, I don't know what all that means, but here I am. Then I re after reading that track, three things that, that Livingston said that I want to leave with you today. Number one, he said, send me anywhere you want me to go, but just go with me. That was his, that was his plea. Send me anywhere you want me to go, but all I ask for is your presence. That reminds me of Moses whenever God said, I'm going to send you up to Pharaoh and I'm going to let some angels go with you. And Moses said, no, if you don't go, I don't go. Amen. Don't you ever, satis don't you ever be satisfied with anything less than the presence and anointing of God upon your life. We don't need a secondhand mantle. We don't need a Spurgeon. We need the God of Spurgeon on our lives for the glory of God. Right. We don't need to say, where is the Elijahs of God? We need to say, where is the God of Elijah? Amen. God on us will make us Elijahs. Yeah. One day, they called and asked while Livingston was home, if he'd come to the University of Glasgow and speak. The university was known as a school that really intimidated speakers. When speakers would come, they would have pea shooters, they'd have rattlers, they'd shuffle their feet. They never ever let a speaker get through speaking, but what they didn't interrupt him and try to intimidate him. And most speakers, they were so embarrassed that they'd walk off the platform intimidated. It was known for that kind of atmosphere. But the day that David Livingston walked on the platform at the university, a holy hush of the presence and power of God sat down on that student body. And for one hour and a half, a man whose arm was hanging limp where a lion had tore him up, whose face was leathery and whose body had been emaciated from fever over and over and over. And yet, when he walked in the door and started across that platform, the whole student body sat in awe and amazement. And for one hour and a half, Nobody shot one pea. Nobody shuffled one foot. Nobody raised one voice. Why? There is just something about the person that dares to let God be God that has on him such an awesomeness of God that even his enemies have to be at peace with him. Are you hearing me? at the convention in St. Louis. First time I'd ever seen it done. They had speakers at different intervals, 15 minutes at a time. One speaker was Manly Beasley, one was Sam Cathy, the other was Eddie Martin, and they were given 15 minutes during the business of the conference to speak. How I got in a room with a big screen, because there's the only place I could find to be seated, and I sat down among people who were not in my camp. I mean, they were opposite of me. Everything they'd vote for, I'd vote against. And everything I voted against, they voted for. I was in the, I was in the middle of that crowd. And I mean, it was, it was really hilarious. I really had fun. 
<laughs> In a moment, Manly Beasley came on the screen to do his 15-minute sermon. Manly Beasley, one of the greatest men of God that ever walked on the face of God's earth, walked in a realm with God as no man I know, had a desire for God and holiness, had a desire to be a man of God. And the day I ran across Manly Beasley in 1962, I said, God, I want to hang around the men that's got God on them. And I want you to know, made such an impact on my life that I wanted to learn more and more from that kind of man how to walk with God. And I watched him. I hung around him. And for 20, 20 years, we preached together. I watched him die for 20 years. I watched him preach when he couldn't set up. You'd have to hold him up. Wore a brace to keep his head up because his neck muscles had collapsed. Sick. The last time I saw him was in January before he died in July. And I had to help dress him for the conference that night because he was so sick he couldn't dress. When I walked in and saw that emaciated body, bunions and knots and skin pulled over bones, Job had nothing on Manly Beasley. Bunions even on his bottom that had to be lacerated because of the infection and had to sit on a cushion. But he would sit there and wait. And when he walked in the pulpit to preach, the power of God all over him. And when he come on the screen to preach, all those people begin to pull out literature and anything they could find to ignore him. Until he got a hold of heaven. <laughs> and he started talking about the access we have to God. That's the power of the believer's life. That train track of intercessory prayer. Touching a holy God and holding on until God breaks through. And I got news for you. So much of the presence of God fell on that place. They dropped their literature and they were compelled by the power of God to hear what he had to say. You let me tell you something, folks. There's no problem we can't overcome. Just let God show up. Send me anywhere you want me to go just sustain me and he went to Africa secondly he said lay any burden on me just sustain me he got to Africa and the first thing that happened he had a child to die next thing that happened he had to send his wife and family home because they couldn't take the pressure in South Africa but he stayed uh, in Africa but he stayed he labored alone stayed by the stuff and Livingston literally stayed there and died so surrendered to Africa and the will of God that he would not have fit this society because that kind of surrender is not being preached from the pulpit anymore. Now it's self-esteem. Preserve yourself. Look for the future and make sure you're retiring well. Uh, make plans to where you can have a good lifestyle. Build for your comfort. But ladies and gentlemen, the men and women that I read about that's touched a nation and a world for God are people so surrendered to the ministry God gave them, all hell couldn't deter their surrender to Christ. Well, finally he got so sick and his last cry was, sever any ties that would cause me to fall short of the course that you've given me. He finally got so sick that they, the New York Times or New York Herald Tribune, I believe, I forget which paper it was. The man said, I want you to go to Africa talking to Stanley and I want you to see if you can find Livingston. I know he's probably sick and see if you can bring him back. And sure enough, they found him. And Livingston looked up, and here came Stanley with his entourage and with the American flag and headed toward him, the first white man he'd seen in some time. Stanley was an atheist. He lived with Livingston as he restored him back to health. And when he restored him back to health in those four months that he stayed with him, he saw so much of God on Livingston that he said, I must come to know the Christ that Livingston knows and Livingston led Stanley to Jesus Christ 
He wouldn't go back to New York with him. He said, I won't go back. I'm staying here till I die. And the man went back and said, Livingston won't come home. And he turned to the jungles of Africa fresh and started touching tribe after tribe with Holy Ghost revival. Finally, he got so bad they put him on a stretcher and carried him by stretcher from tribe to tribe until finally he got so bad that they had to finally stop. They built him a little shed, something to rest under, and they placed that stretcher with Stanley on it so weak he could barely move. And they watched over him so no animals or th any things would bother him, but they, they were in a very, very isolated place. But his entourage took care of him. Finally, the man that was seated at the door of his little place of a tent or cover, finally the man heard something rustling. And he looked in the tent. And Livingston was on his knees with his face buried in his hand. He turned back and left him alone, figured he was praying. But four hours later, he opened the little curtain and looked in again, and he was in the same position. And come to find out, Livingston had died on his knees with his face buried in his hand, with a heart for Africa that it would be touched for the glory of God. Now, you know why I stood at that statue and cried? Because I've been tempted so many times to let up, to back off, to not be so intolerant, to be, to be more compatible. Don't be classified as a wild Bill Stafford. Don't be called that you're too hard. Your preaching is too strong. People won't have it anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, that day, I made up my mind. I was going to finish my course like God started me. And I'm going to hang around the Paige Pattersons and the Dr. Press, Press, Presslers. I'm going to hang around the men of God that are sold out to one thing at any price. We must touch America with the gospel of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that day on my motor coach, I laid on my face and my wife weeping with me and said, Lord, do it again and do it again and do it again and let me die with America on my heart for Holy Ghost revival. Today, I waited till this last service because I want to come to the altar myself. And I'm going to fall on my face with you. I am calling today. Would you like to just slip out of your seat with me today? Not on your emotion. Even though I'm stirred, my emotions are not govern governing me. My will is governing me right now. I'm going to will. I'm going to will a fresh surrender to the Lordship of Christ. And I'm going to ask some of you, I know all of you may not hear what I'm saying, but I really am not interested in just everybody unless God really speaks to you. But you that God's speaking to, maybe some of you not even saved. If you don't know you're saved, for God's sakes, get it settled today. Trust Christ. I'm going to ask you to come. While we stand, with heads bowed and eyes closed, will you stand with me? We're going to ask them to play softly and we're going to sing. That's it. Just come on now. We don't have to wait for a song. Just come on. Just go ahead and play, Brother Arm. And we'll, we'll sing. Well, just come on. That's it.